welcome back to another episode of Over the Glass. I am your host, Jay. Co-host Nessa here. And we have a surprise today, or this week. Go ahead, introduce yourself. <laughs> uh, what's up, Over the Glass fans, friends, family? Um, <laughs> I am Andrew Willis. So I'm going to be, um, I guess, a special super uh, Florida man third host here on Over the Glass. Hooray! Yay! We're, We're so excited to have you. <laughs> so, um, for folks who are not familiar, we had. Do you want to be called Andrew or Drew? Um, most people will call me by Drew. I listen. Either's fine. I just um, I hold steadfast to the fact I'm not an Andy. So that's great because my brother's <laughs> Andy. Oh, I wouldn't want to call you that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Drew, I mean, everybody calls me Drew, so Drew works. Cool. Okay. All right. So we had Drew on a few weeks back, and, you know, we just really enjoyed your company. And on top of that, you are an aspiring host for a future podcast at some point. So we thought, you know what? Sounds like a good deal. Let's let's bring him back on. Let's, let's get some, you know, extra bodies here on over the glass the more the merrier extra queerness Let's extra queerness more queer yeah out here. <laughs> so um Wait, i'm bringing in that fourth line grit you know <laughs> good waiver wire pickup <laughs> i think i think we're all fourth line here so <laughs> but i'm um, not even on the bench y'all <laughs> Nessa's the equipment manager. I'm I'm the goalie who's getting peppered with way too many shots because defense, what is that? Um, but if you want to learn a little more about Drew, I would go check out our previous episode with him um, being trans in hockey. Drew covers the Iceman, is a avid Vancouver Canucks fan, you know, just just all around awesome guy. Um, so let's just kind of open up with uh, I noticed the other day that you were at the Iceman's home opener. And my first impression, as I was telling you um, offline, that I've never been to an ECHL game like the um, I've been. Well, now that I take that back, once upon a time. There was the San Francisco Bulls, and I can't remember off the oh, top yeah. of my head. Were they ECHL? I have no idea. They were, I th- believe the Bulls were West Coast. So that at one point in time, all of the minor leagues, I'm finding out, have just like sort of ate themselves and conglomerated somewhere in history. So I believe the Bulls were what was the West Coast Hockey League. So it was kind of like East Coast adjacent. So kind of along the same like level, I would say, right? Yeah, it was still like 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 what sem- semi pro minor leagues farm teams. I don't think at the time. I don't think any of those teams had like farm partnerships. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think it was more like just semi pro stuff. Yeah. So I guess in a way, I've been to a similar level of hockey, um, like way back in the day when we had the Bulls, um, but. Outside of that, like, I've only kind of seen, like, Major Junior, like, pictures and videos and, like, those being out in Canada. I mean, that people eat, live, sleep, breathe hockey out there. So it's no surprise that those uh, arenas are, you know, pretty packed. But to see an ECHL team in Florida, I mean, I know that they've got the two NHL teams, but it was still like, wow, that's really cool that this team has so much um interest and 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 a fan base coming out to watch them yeah it was uh 11,378 last night for the Iceman home opener um which is I'm I'm trying to get confirmation of this but I believe that falls within the top five attendance records uh for single game for the team um I think it was like 12,365 showed up to a game back in February um, when the Icewind were making a run for first place here in the division. Um, I think first place in the conference at the time as well, actually, if that if I'm recalling the right moment in February. Um, it's pretty cool. It was, it was interesting to see normally average attendance. Jacksonville's been leading the league for the last like three, four seasons now in attendance. We average about 8,000 people per game. Um, 
it's really a dramatic difference. I showed up the team. We first got the team in 2017. Um, I showed up actually with a friend from out of state in the Midwest. Him and I are used to, you know, big barns and big houses and packed houses when the hockey game is. And we showed up in uh, maybe a thousand or so people in the stands that night. It was a pretty abysmal performance by the team on the ice, too. So we Jacksonville had a team back in the 90s and the early 2000s, um, the Jacksonville Lizard Kings. And the team had pretty good attendance back in those days, too. So when we had the Iceman at first, it was kind of like, all right, is this going to work here? Because it, it was a different even, like, standard of hockey than we were used to with the Lizard Kings. Um, so the last couple seasons, they've retooled the coaching. They've made some front office changes and that's been reflected in the fans getting engaged too. So it's pretty cool to be, um, here in Jacksonville and be in Florida and be a team that's leading the, te- like the, the entire league for years now in attendance and fan engagement. Um, I've never seen the, the upper bowl open in Vice Star Memorial Arena last night. And, uh, it was, it was that. People, like, literally at all ends, in the nosebleeds, it was awesome. It was uh, definitely a very loud environment. And uh, the team, they went up against the, the in-state rivals, the Florida Everblades, which are actually the two-time defending Kelly Cup champions. They've been the thorn in our side. We can't get out of round two every time we go against the Everblades. Um, so we we kind of put we kind of put a rain on their parade, too, a little bit, you know, in front of a big crowd. One, it was a 3-1 win there. Sounds like your attendance out there is uh, about on par with what the Sharks are putting up right now. <laughs> <laughs> it looked way more packed than what we see on TV for the Sharks, though. <laughs> <laughs> Bigger it's, arena. I always used to joke that it was weird showing up to, like, a big game here in Jacksonville and seeing more people in Jacksonville stands as compared to, like, a Panthers game. Mm. So now that I've seen the Panthers got their attendance up, I'm like, okay, all right. <laughs> Just, I feel slightly less bad about it now. <laughs> Cool. Did they win? No. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, 3 1. Yep. It was awesome. They, uh, a couple of uh, rookies got their first points in Iceman sweaters last night. And not necessarily rookies, but guys new to the league as well. So uh, it was uh, impressive. I was kind of nervous with some of the retooling that had happened in the offseason, but um, they definitely looked like a better team out there last night. Like, we could beat these guys in round two, I think. <laughs> <laughs> We're rooting for you. Um, who is their, who are they affiliated with? Um, so last couple seasons, it was with the Rangers and Hartford. The Wolfpack was our mid-stop. This season in July, uh, we're going into it with the Sabres as our affiliate, uh, making the Rochester Americans our a- AHL team. That's always kind of confusing to me. I like, I from the NHL to the AHL, like that part makes sense. But when they just kind of like, isn't it, the Hurricanes don't have an ECHL team right now. They don't have an AHL team. Their ECHL now team I'm is super Norfolk. confused. <laughs> yeah, which was, and that's confused me too. I don't know how they're going into the season without an AHL team. They had, um, I think it was like six or seven players. They had tried to reassign to Norfolk in the ECHL, and those players opted to go back overseas and play hockey. Because um, <laughs> who was it from? The Canes, his name escapes me right now. Um, oh, my God, I had him on my fantasy team last season. <laughs> They're the backup. The backup, not Ronta, but the guy below him. Like, he got – because Ronta and Anderson are up, they sent him down. But then I saw, the um, like, during the first week, like, because of the situation that they have, he's, like, on loan to, like, the Tampa Bay Lightning's AHL team. And I went – Huh? Like, how does that work? Like, so that's got to just be like, I I mean, I don't know, maybe like the guys on the team don't really care about that sort of stuff. But it's like, I don't know. I I think that's just so strange. And now I really need to find out. It's weird. What his name is, because it's at the tip of my tongue. And it bothers me. Uh, The check off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I just had it too, mm-hmm. like just earlier, like two or three days ago. I was reading the article, and I was like, ah, interesting, because the the Canes are in a weird spot without that midway stop in their development line. I mean, they don't exactly so. have a problem right now with their talent. <laughs> right, they don't. Right. They don't. Right. They don't have some of the <laughs> some of the problems that other franchises have. <laughs> other winless winless franchises but i mean like you know Oof. to talk about one of those franchises <laughs> like way back in the day 
when the Sharks were over in, in Massachusetts, they had their AHL, to, uh, AHL team, the Worcester Sharks. Like, it's so much nicer when a player gets called up because they just, like, kind of walk into the next room kind of thing because both of them are now in San Jose. But when we had a player go down and maybe they're on the road trip, it's just, like, a whole, like, a whole day's worth of trying to figure out, like, where did the AHL team go? How are they going to get this guy they're calling up? And, yeah, just a whole crazy thing. It's so it's such a wild like when the when the Icemen were first um, in the ECHL, their affiliate was the Winnipeg Jets. So, I, I, especially like ECHL travel is terrible. So I'm just like imagine you're you're in the ECHL emergency call happens on like the AHL level and you're need to be in you know Vancouver for an NHL game and you're in you're playing a game in like a sterile Florida, which is like three or four hours south of here. Like what a terrible time to have in your life. <laughs> So I think it it makes more sense, I think, with us to New York. But even still, that feels a little distant, you know? Nessa, who was the guy from last season who was making the jump? Strauss, man. Yeah. Because our ECHL team now is the Wichita Thunder. And he kept having to (laughs) fly, fly across to come back. Literally every other game, they were sending him back and forth, the poor guy. I wrote the uh, I wrote Wichita's like season uh, recap actually because I was asked to take some some teams and, and cover the teams and I was like okay I'll do some espionage work for the Canucks I'll I'll look at a uh, San Jose's like prospect pipeline and I came across that the, like those stories a few times when I was looking up the season recap for Wichita like doing the research I was like oh what a nightmare that poor dude <laughs> it's just a backward, backward. yeah so they put him through that hell last season and then they didn't even re-sign him for this season. <laughs> Like, thanks, thanks, guy. <laughs> thanks for getting us air miles. I don't know. We're we're managing that team just as uh, just as well as uh, Chrissy's managing her fantasy team. <laughs> wow, I'm saying she's cutthroat. She's cutthroat. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, I guess we should fill you in, Drew. Since uh, this this season, we started a fantasy league. And Nessa and a lot of uh, other friends joined in, but Nessa's girlfriend, like I was joking last last week or the week before that, that in the first week of fantasy, she was just, she was really getting familiar with adding and dropping people. I'm like, man, her team is just like, if you, if you lose, get off my bench. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand she had injuries and stuff, so I'm obviously exaggerating, but like I was I was having fun with if, it. <laughs> if you didn't know that she was dealing with the injuries, it really looked like was, dang, she really doesn't like these players. Just like cutthroat GM, just every that locker room <laughs> culture is just shot. <laughs> You come in here and you and you provide points to the team, or you can find another team. <laughs> you, and you provide like points. literally, you don't even get you don't even get to sit on the bench and for the the rest of the third. You're literally like they got you You're a plane ticket. Mm-hmm. And get out of here. Chrissy's <laughs> employing the producer reduce uh, strategy when it comes to managing her team. <laughs> oh gosh, she calmed down this week though. She hasn't had as many injuries. <laughs> Um, so um how are the canucks doing in the first two weeks are we in the first two weeks now of of the season well it could be worse oh we know know Um, about that (laughs) (laughs) we're starting with the good news your team is the good news We are what number two in the, the the conference, the division. I just was looking. Must um, be nice. <laughs> listen, listen. Let me ride this wave because in like a week it'll be November and I won't get to have it anymore. I <laughs> I saw a picture this morning where it's you know it's been used a lot where it's the guy who's like the medal and biting it and then it's got the tier of all the other teams and he's in third and it's got yeah. the Canucks in second and like of course the Sharks are only at bottom and it's like yeah <laughs> celebrate. <laughs> I mean. 
I'm not. I don't have anything to complain about really when it comes to the Canucks um, because we're we're three and two. I was actually, as a matter of fact, before we started recording, that's what that's what got me so caught up earlier. Is I was invested in the game I missed from last night when I was at the Iceman game. So I like purposely stayed off of Twitter so I didn't see any of the highlights. So I was like really into it. You would have thought they were playing this morning in my house. <laughs> <laughs> I was Quinter got the power play goal and I was like, I fantastic this is beautiful what a wonderful sunday morning yes thank you quinn <laughs> and sorry that i benched you yesterday <gasps> Oof. i know hey you know what first, first world defenseman problems i could not choose i i played him the previous night and he got me like a handful of shots on goal and i'm like unacceptable in benching you <laughs> <laughs> Unacceptable. Wow, you're over here talking smack about Christy. <laughs> hey, I didn't, I didn't ship him off to another team, okay? <laughs> I didn't put him on waivers, all right? <laughs> Jeez. All right, fair. Listen, oh. the, the guy that I'm going against this week, like, it has been cutthroat, so I've had to make some decisions. <laughs> Man, my fantasy team, it was, like, neck and neck all the way up to, like, yesterday. So I was like, I got a chance because I was only down, like, 1.4 points. Some arbitrary number, like, out there. And then I got home last night, and now I'm losing by 37. So I'm like, okay, cool. cool Wait, cool, cool, what, cool, cool, what cool. type of league do you play in? <laughs> um, me and my, well, my friend Gabby's been running it for a while. It's, uh, it's like, a ESPN, like, one of ESPN's leagues. Okay. Is yeah. it, because we're in a head-to-head category, so is yours... Like a points only? No, ours is, uh, we do like head to head matchups every week. I guess I don't understand the, <laughs> like, the, <laughs> your, your makeup of, you said you were down by a certain amount of points. So that's what I don't understand. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure how, the, I'm not sure what the ins and outs of the scoring are, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't ask the technical questions. I just play. <laughs> When it, <laughs> I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> when it comes to my fantasy league, I'm just like, I'm just happy to work here, my guy. <laughs> Sounds like a great GM. <laughs> I just hope everyone has fun. <laughs> we're, we're here to have a good time. <laughs> That's that know, locker like room my culture. Week, it, it, I, it, was, it was, listen, my first week was like good vibes. But now I'm a little bit like, especially when I drop like 37 points in a matter of hours, I was like, all right, we're now it's time for producer reduce, you know, like Fantilli looking at you, bud. I know <laughs> we have him. And I'm like, you barely, you barely scored your first goal. You've only had a handful of shots on goal. What are you doing over there? Right, right. Like, wake up. I, my fantasy <laughs> team needs you. <laughs> Damn, isn't he like 18? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but listen, Leo listen, Carlson made his I'm debut and scored you, already. I'm going to send you to your room unless you start producing. No dinner. <laughs> You're grounded. Get out of my sight. What's the fantasy league equivalent of a bag skate? That's what you're getting. Huh, I don't know. Benched for the week. Benched for the week. Who cares about your points now? <laughs> So in in Sharks news, um, we just you know what I'm just here for the vibes right Why now. Why are you laughing? We haven't said anything yet. <laughs> Excuse you. <We're> rude. <laughs> it's different to be in a position where I can do that though. <laughs> Last season, somebody bring up the Canucks. It's just like yeah, hang my head in shame. <laughs> So right, this week down. in, in Sharks <laughs> news, um, Sharks welcomed, or I guess NBC, because that's the network that primarily covers the Sharks, had welcomed Jason Demers. He's back with the Sharks. He spent, Whoa. I think it was like I don't know him. 08 to 2015, he was with the Sharks, and then he was moved around for a bit, and now he's retired. And like a while back, I saw that he was on mm, Shen Peng's uh, podcast who is uh, one of our beat writers and they were talking about it um and a while back i um during the sharks pride parade 
I like tried asking Tar, do you know anything about this? Like, can can I get the insider? And you know, she didn't know she didn't know what would happen. And well, he got hired. And I think, as far as vibes is concerned, I think it's great that they brought in someone who was a fan favorite when he was with the Sharks. Um, and our resident. Um, fan cam creator like meme uh enthusiast uh alex who's snipe city 420 on on twitter has been going on about trying to get <laughs> anyone on the sharks broadcast to start referring to william acklin as slippery pete it's been going on since the last year. <laughs> he is so determined, and I don't get it. I don't understand where it came from. So Do apparently, you? it's a Seinfeld um, reference, which I didn't know about. Okay. I sent it to a friend I it. of mine like earlier this week, and she was the one who told me, even though she's like not too familiar with like Seinfeld in general. I was mostly invested in it because of how determined he was. <laughs> <laughs> so the, he was tweeting at the broadcasters. He tweeted at Jason Demers, and Jason Demers like responded, and he did a whole like video response to it. And he's like, "I like I don't know for certain, but there's rumors that are going around <laughs> that William Eklund's nickname is a uh, slippery Pete." So I think <laughs> it is just so fun that Jason Demers is just giving back to the fan base. And it's just holding up the vibes because we need a lot of it right now. <laughs> I don't get it. I love to see it. <laughs> it's so slippery. <laughs> and then he like does these dumb videos of, of like them talking about Eklund, and then he'll like voice like edit over and say slippery Pete. <laughs> <laughs> if you are not following Alex right now. You need to follow Alex. Snipe twenty, <laughs> uh, Snipe City four twenty. You gotta find him on Twitter. Shout out to Alex. We I love will him. Give, I will give Alex a follow. I'm gonna adopt this slippery Pete terminology. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get it to catch on. Great, perfect. You can write about it. <laughs> the move, the movement. <laughs> For sure. We're trying to get him on the pod one day, but we'll see. <laughs> Um, are we still talking about, <sighs> look, the Sharks had an interesting week, aside from Jason Demers uh, being added on to the broadcast team. Um, they, they had this crazy thing going on with the waiver wire, where, who was it? Kevin oh, LeBanc. Friedman? No, no, no. Oh, no, no. Uh, <laughs> Frank Cervelli. <laughs> Frank Cervelli. Frank Cervelli. Randomly posted one day, I can't remember what day it was, that Kevin LeBanc has been put on waivers by the San Jose Sharks. And I'm like, what? Like, I I, I messaged it to our Discord. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Because yesterday they announced that he was going to be in the lineup. This makes no sense. There's a trade happening. Like, I don't understand. This doesn't make sense. And then, so we're having a discussion about it. And then, like, all of the, the beat reporters for the Sharks are like, this is weird because he was announced that he was going to be in the lineup for tonight. Like, okay, we're going to check up on, like, we're going to double check and, and basically fact check. And like within 10, 20 minutes, they started posting, like, we talked to his representative, like his agent. They said they don't know anything about this. They talked to a bank. He was like, I, I hadn't heard anything about this. <laughs> it's like, who, where did this news come from? And then probably like an hour, hour and a half after they announced which players were actually put on waivers. And it was um, Shimmick, yeah. which I think maybe he misheard. I don't know how they get these 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 news. Like, are they on the phone? Do they get texts? So like, <laughs> My guess is that if it was like a voice thing, um, he probably heard the last syllable of the name, just heard the K, <laughs> and he was like, oh, LeBanc. <laughs> I just I just love how quick Jay was to be like, it was Kevin LeBanc. That was who Vic was victimizing all this. <laughs> Listen, people who have been, who've been following this podcast for a while know where I stand on LeBanc, but it's still kind of messed up. To have this put out on Twitter, I mean, he, like, they when he was asked about it, he was just like, you know, like, no, I haven't been looking at Twitter, I'm kind of busy. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, 
like you know like even going back to like something like like uh flurry was it flurry who found out on twitter that he's being traded Mm -hmm. like that's just Mm -hmm. all kinds of messed up like no one needs to hear about that and also this goes back to me and nessa always being like god like no one gives two shits about the sharks (laughs) and when they like i hate listening to people who are not informed about the sharks talk about the sharks because it's like you obviously don't follow the sharks and it's so annoying to hear them being like god what are the sharks doing like you clearly are not following the sharks because <laughs> maybe you should pay attention maybe you should pay attention <laughs> so this in itself is like god you're trying to report about the sharks and you have no idea about the sharks it's so annoying and so after all that came out where like the beat writers were at practice, asking the sources, even asking like Greer and Greer's like, there was no there- discussion whatsoever <laughs> that LeBanc was going to go on waivers. We have no plans to put him on waivers. Freaking just- Frank Cerebelli, you know, tweets afterwards. He's like, after informing <laughs> LeBanc's camp that he'll be placed on waivers today, uh, the San Jose Sharks have reversed course. <laughs> And LeBanc is now expected to make his season debut tonight. Like, but like we already said, there were no discussions. <laughs> there were no plans to ever put him on waivers. So obviously Frank messed up and then is too proud to admit it. And he's like, oh, it's all that the sharks are being ridiculous. But then everyone Because like, the news came out. Now we're like, oh, oops. <laughs> Frank's just bored. He's just bored, you know? Causing drama for no reason. But, I mean, that's oh, that's the only thing we've had going for us this week. So, thanks, I guess. Like, like people, like, like I'm desperate for some positive news for the Sharks. But other people are desperate to talk about anything related to the Sharks. That it's like they hear, like, a little sliver of information. And they're just like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Hey, I, I will, I'll say this. I mean, that game against Colorado... That was a, I, I, I was really, I, listen, I thought you guys stood a fighting chance for a minute there, for a I while. I so too. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> this is, that's, it's that's what we <laughs> like to do. We like to reel you in, and then we slap you senseless. <laughs> Yeah, I, I turned it on. and I was like, man, I was like, look at San Jose. I was like, look at San Jose about to beat Colorado. And then that's see, when it, it didn't see. happen. McCarr came through, which I'm not mad at because he's on my fantasy team. So <laughs> <laughs> No, OK, so that that game was really good. Well, I thought it was pretty good. Um, and then the one against Carolina, they were fighting pretty well up until the third period, like the last 10 <laughs> minutes, they completely imploded. And then last night was just awful. It was like the team that everyone thought they were going to be, right? Putting them dead last in the league. It's like, yeah, I see it now. <laughs> Who did the Sharks play last night? The, the Predators. Oh, oh. Listen, oh. if the Sharks <laughs> are not going to win and they're mm. not going to show up, like, for most of the game, you could have at least given me the sorrow shutout. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> No, because Hurdle's scoring. He's on my fantasy God, team. Come on. Like, I actually groaned at that because I'm like, you guys aren't even doing anything. You couldn't even give me the shutout. But you fail at failing. <laughs> Listen, if this doesn't count for anything, if you're even going to, like, push this into overtime, like, allow me to get the points, okay? It's okay because I got the points. Thank you. Thank you, Hurdle. <laughs> <laughs> but what was oh, it that, Thomas was it the Colorado game that Mackenzie Blackwood saw like over 50 shots yeah I think so yeah it was 51 yeah. everyone's saying oh over 50 sh-. it was 51 shots like simmer down y'all <laughs> and they what they tied it up like what within the last minute of the game three minutes or something yeah that's when I tuned in because I seen it was still scoreless and I was like, well, what's going on on this channel? We found, and I was we like, found okay. the problem. <laughs> we found the problem. You tuned in. <laughs> I'm here to wreck, I'm here to wreck the whole Western Conference's vibes. You're like, mm, I see it's you. good for the Sharks. <laughs> <laughs> Did somebody say new basement dwelling? <laughs> Listen, get Arm out of our feeders. basement, okay? <laughs> I feel like I feel like that's what I should be saying to you guys a little bit, you know? 
Like, get out of here. We were starting to clean up the place. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Now we have a second story condo. That's kind of <laughs> how it feels. <laughs> In the Sharks game last night, because they did so awful, apparently, which I, I was like half, not even half paying attention to the game, to be honest with you. Because I was, I was having game night with Chrissy. We're long distance now. So we were playing game on Switch together. <laughs> but um, apparently Quinn decided to hold Vlasic accountable and like benched him for all. Did he bench him for the whole third or just like I'm pretty a sure. Lot of it? But you know what? I I feel like it might have started even more, even further back than that. Because he only played six, six minutes of ice time. The whole game. Yeah. Wow. That's interesting because no no other coach has held these players accountable like that, which is interesting to see. Sometimes that goes a long way that accountability. Like I, I wish I wish the Canucks <laughs> would bench Tyler Myers. Like at this point, I, he's out there. Like the first two games of the season, it was almost like he had a death wish for like Elias Pettersson to not make it like healthy through the first month of the year. He's he's out there knocking him down, like firing slap shots into him. Listen, he has the name Chaos Giraffe for a reason, and I really just think we need to put him permanently in his enclosure because he's causing some problems. <laughs> put him back in the <laughs> like, cage. <laughs> right, right. Like, he doesn't... We just... You know, accountability, especially with, like, like defensemen, too, because you have... A, listen, if you're having a bad day and your goalie's having a bad day, everybody's having a bad day, eventually, you know? And... Tyler Myers is just so careless. I wish somebody would send him a message and be just like, that's where you sit now. Eat your hay like a good giraffe <laughs> over yonder. You think about what Don't... you did. <laughs> right. right. You're grounded <laughs> until you can get it together. Until you can learn a zone exit. Like, just sit there. So, I I think it's different with, with the veteran players like Vlasic getting benched because I think that sends a different type of message too. That's good. I think a, a culture of accountability is good, you know. And like Rick Tockett's relationship with JT Miller. JT Miller is uh, somebody that I feel like people think I'm dunking on him, but I'm not. I'm just like holding him accountable as a fan. His body language is sometimes terrible. He stops in the middle of the play, but under Rick Tockett, he's been a, a different type of player. Rick Tockett's like called him out on those things directly, and uh, he looks like a different sort of JT. Like he looks like he's. I don't want to say like, oh, now he looks like he was worth the first round pick in the trade, but it's like if you would have just produced at this rate and then not been so terrible with like your body language on the ice, then I would have been, I would have felt more comfortable the first round pick years ago. <laughs> so the yeah. culture of accountability, I, I like it, you know? I think the the thing the fans were interested, or I guess, I don't know if they would have been upset at this happening um, last year or whatever. Like, the fans have been really frustrated with Vlasic for years now because his play has declined for a while. Um, and fans don't feel like he's living up to his contract. You know, everyone's saying, oh, he has the worst contract in the league now. He has a no move, uh, no move clause. What is it called? No, no trade and then clause. No move. Basically, it was like we drafted he's him. <laughs> it was, he took hometown discounts probably, you know, here and there for when he years. Was good. But then Doug Wilson <laughs> gave him like an eight year contract when he was like entering like his 30s seven. like it's just it it mm -hmm. was not a good one it was not mm. gonna age well and like Nessa was saying just over the last like couple of years it's just like you're just doing the bare minimum he used to be like what they called you know shut down defenseman like you when he's out there with a uh, Braun who was then traded over to I want to say he Philadelphia Philadelphia yeah it's just after that year it just looks like he's like I don't I don't really know what you're doing but it's like you're not even like okay I was thinking about this last night and like how critical people were being with like Eric Carlson oh he makes so much money and like he just was either injured or like he just wasn't able to live up to what we like expected him to do when he was with with Ottawa, but, but like he was still producing. Yeah, but he was at least right, actively yeah. trying. You saw him out on the ice. Like I had to read that tweet to realize that Vlasic wasn't on the ice for like the last how many minutes of the game. Oof. Like that's just like you know people like um, 
maybe you'd be able to give us insight on Kyle uh, Burroughs because now we have him and he is quickly becoming my second favorite defenseman because he's paired up with our favorite defenseman, Mario Ferraro. And like, yeah, they're not perfect, but out of the clusterfuck of our like roster right now, <laughs> like they've been a highlight. Like they've been, you know, like they look like they come in and they're like, we're bringing in the things that we discussed during practice and what we need to work on. And like the broadcast has talked about, like they've been like, two of the best defensemen out on the ice right now. And it's like, they aren't necessarily scoring goals and things like that, but they're doing what they need to do. And they're, you know, they just, to me that, that those are the guys that I was happy to see, like doing what they need to do last night. I I love Kyle Burroughs. I I love Kyle Burroughs. I think he's a stud. I really do. He's not going to be your goal scorer. He's not going to be that kind of guy. But he is a dude that gets around the ice really well. He can open up space. He's not afraid to hit the corners hard and get in there and get into puck battles. Um, and he's great about winning those battles too. Um, one of the things I loved about Burrow, Burrows in particular was his ability to force turnovers. He's just so aggressive sometimes in on the play that he can pinch those guys down and high out, you know, into that offensive zone enough to where they're coughing up the puck along along the blue line quite a bit. Um, just he was he had, he had pretty you know nothing like phenomenal in in Vancouver but analytically he was a pretty sharp D man especially when you rarely you would see him jump alongside like Quinn um, a lot of times he was the voice of reason in that D pairing with Tyler Myers uh, you know if if Mizey is back there tripping over everybody and, and causing a, a scene it was typically Burroughs that was able to uh, you know dictate the pace and and keep Vancouver at least in possession of uh, trying, you know, a, a chance to try to get something done. So I like Bros, and I think if you put him up with a, a strong, like, offensive style defenseman, it could be a really complimentary game. He could, I think, you get some good secondary secondary scoring out of Kyle Bros in that way. Thrun later. <laughs> we're we're still waiting on our offensive defenseman to show up. Yeah, but he needs to develop yeah. a little. But you know what? It, maybe it could be Ferraro. Like the last couple of years, he's been kind of like the first year that we had him, he was paired up with Burns. And, you know, Burns was the offensive defenseman. So he was kind of there as like the mainstay on the blue line, like cleaning up Burns' mess when he would jump in and then fuck it up. And it's like, oh, got to go. <laughs> cover your ass but now because eric carlson's gone like we're kind of like who's going to help move the move the play into the offensive zone and um i think i think they're still working that out with our defense like even last night they tried kyle burrows like on our first power play unit because why the hell not um, I he, like I thought it looked. He got all right. power play time in Vancouver. Okay. Yeah, he got. Uh, yeah, I think so. You think he? I, he. I don't know if it was power play two or power play one time, because like parts of you know the last few seasons I have chosen to box up and place outside of my memory banks. But uh, I know Burroughs got a few good looks on on the power play unit in Vancouver, and he's he's great about getting like from the point driving from the point kind of into that high slot zone. And even if, like, in the, in the instance of, like, the Canucks, he would kind of look for that pass right there on the doorstep. But if you, he has it within his capacity, I think, I mean, maybe I'm just overly optimistic, but I, I think Burroughs could have it in his capacity to show more shades of an offensive game because he got good looks in, in, in Vancouver. Uh, how many of those looks, you know, made it to a, a high danger area is a, probably another discussion. But, um, and Ferraro, too. I believe Ferraro got a look in, in Vancouver a couple years ago at, like, training camp or prospects camp. Um, and I thought I thought he looked good, you know, as comparison to, like, at the time, Vancouver's four party city mannequins and two traffic cones we were calling a defensive core. So <laughs> I have Ferraro and Burroughs could be a, could be a, a, a good pairing in the long Are term. Are you sure it was Ferraro? Because we, we no, drafted Ferraro him was drafted by he, the Sharks. he went the collegiate route. Is there another Ferraro then? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm. I'm so certain. Like I'm so certain. I'll have to look it up at for see because it for sure can see because it was it was a couple years ago. It was like at a prospect. It was like prospects camp or like definitely not Mario camp. then. He was on the no. Sharks. <laughs> huh. Yeah. 
weird. I'm gonna look that All up. Right. <laughs> Maybe I do have it. I'm I'm so certain. I'm so certain because it was like, uh, is he related? So what's his name? Ray Ferraro. Ray Ferraro. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So the one that was in our camp, I believe, was related to Ray Ferraro. Okay. So okay. I'm gonna have to look that up now. Yeah. 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 Gosh, what a hockey name. <laughs> <laughs> And um, <laughs> even though this goes against the sharks, I have to commend the equipment manager for the Predators. Um, what's for his, his face? assist? Um, Evangelista broke his stick on a play. He went over to the bench. The equipment manager was ready with, in hand with a stick. And, and, and Evangelista still had time for a breakaway. <laughs> <laughs> On the yeah, sharks, like, on the, yeah. wow, that just makes it look so much worse that he had time to go to the bench to grab a stick <laughs> and a breakaway. And oh my then, gosh, but it's cute how the players are celebrating yeah, the, the, with, the, with yeah. the equipment manager. They were like, "Yeah, like, yeah. assist to him assist. too." <laughs> so that's I, I want I that for the sharks one day. <laughs> <sighs> The fact that the, the equipment manager is getting assists. Um... Stop it. You hold your <laughs> no tongue comment. right now. <laughs> <laughs> We're already living it. <laughs> um, well, let, let's move on to the Oilers. Um, maybe you, you can tell us about how excited you are that the Canucks beat them not once but twice, right? How sweet it is. <laughs> How sweet it is. <laughs> um, yeah, the eight to one game, the season opener was spectacular. Insane. With Insane. Four goals. I I you guys were in the Discord, like what Canucks team is this? And I had been asking myself that for like forty minutes at that point. I was like, Wait, are they from a lab? What did we do? <laughs> <laughs> They're on steroids. <laughs> right. Four four three was a little bit more like okay. All right, you know, like it was, we took on a, a tough team, you know, one of those Stanley Cup, team, you know, favorites for this year. Uphill battle, still edged out the win. I was like, that was more realistic. But the season opener, I was like, somebody has put a lot of sugar in Brock Besser's Fruit Loops. What is happening <laughs> to this team? <laughs> who who uh, was but, it that Peter, uh, Pedersen, like, completely annihilated with a, with a hit? He just went Cody f- flying into him. <laughs> Cody CC. I love it. My it's so it's so crazy. Like last year I seen PD kind of people will I, I hold the fact that like Elias Pedersen is gonna have to run through every person in the league before they finally stop saying well, he's so small. Cause like last year dude was knocking over people with reverse hits left and right. He runs through CC and the first thing they say on the broadcast is is well yeah, when he gets to be a bit bigger, you know, just imagine what those hits are like. And I'm like Yeah. Yeah, when he finally puts on some weight, you guys, because he's, you know, 196 from 176 at his draft year is a drop in the bucket. Just a couple pounds. He ate a Twinkie. Like, wait, he's going to have to run through everybody before they finally start putting some respect on Elias Pet- Pedersen's physical game. But uh, I-, I love Maybe it if he goes time. up like, against uh, Tyler Myers one game because Tyler's doing some crazy thing, <laughs> he puts him down. I don't know if that's a game where they want. It was like, <laughs> but it was like oh yeah, maybe he is big. <laughs> the one time Tyler Myers like ran over Petey in, I think it was like the third game of the season. It was like, it was like he just did, just was bored, like bored on the blue line, don't want to play defense. I'm going to go run into my star forward. Like, what are we doing? What are we, we, we pay him like what? Six point however million dollars a year. And he's six foot seven. It's 6.7 million for a six foot seven guy. So we pay him like 1.1 mil for every foot of him. We just pay him to be tall. We just pay him to be tall. I, I mean, yeah, he got a goal. All right. He's contributed a little bit, but like risk versus reward in Tyler Myers. <laughs> Give me the party city mannequin again, you know, <laughs> Tyler Myers can be the equivalent of a Kevin O'Bank or like the recently well, departed they were rumored, Noah Gregor. They were rumored to get traded for each other over the off season. Remember? Yeah. <laughs> I was. Uh, we were all. Everybody in Vancouver is like, please, please, please. <laughs> are you so sure, like, though? Are you sure? You? Are you, are you sure? <laughs> 
It's I mean, well, Bank doesn't run over our own players. He just doesn't do anything. <laughs> Risk versus reward, you know? What is, what's the payoff here? <laughs> I think Vancouver would have been very happy with Le Bank. <laughs> That's, last couple last couple seasons we were desperate. It was like a, just a body. Like we will dress the random guy in section two twenty to come play defense if he has the ability <laughs> to like take a block. <laughs> so last night the Oilers lost yet again, and there's <laughs> there's some news that McDavid left during the third period, so potentially injured. So you know can always get worse for them um but as media goes in areas like the um eat sleep eat sleep live breathe uh canada dry was asked a interesting question of what he what he would have said to stewart skinner when stewart went out to play the puck handle it badly and they and the opposing team scored again and and dry just like i was laughing my ass off where he was just like like nothing i would say nothing to him like he made a mistake like we all make mistakes like like why are you asking me this question i'm just like so (laughs) tired of the media asking me these like stupid questions for like your one like headline caption oh leon dry like you know just they started gang wars in the Edmonton locker room. Like they're trying to stir trouble. <laughs> they're trying to get the clicks with like some crazy quote from from Dry and like we saw this a lot last year. I'm sure it's been happening like for far longer. But like I don't know. That's like it's just so silly sometimes when I see this sort of stuff. Where it's just like it makes me kind of glad that we're not. A right. big hockey market, as they say, so we don't have these annoying journalists bugging our players here. Because <laughs> some of the questions the they ask, that, like the crazy thing that kills me is like with storylines around like Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. So for years now, they've been like getting the same question: Is it time to leave Edmonton? Is it time? Or do you feel the constraints of age as you pursue <laughs> a Stanley Cup? All of these like crazy questions that Connor and Leon keep getting ha- having to field, and the, the, the response is the same every time. Even if Connor McDavid does sound slightly more depressed every time he says, "No, we still have time in Edmonton," and you, I just think, okay, like in the event, so they've been giving us the same answer for however many seasons now. In the event that something happens and these guys do move or walk from Edmonton. The storyline is still, like, going to continue because it's, like, the same thing, you know, like, the media has been fishing for so long for, like, that kind of storyline to be there. By the time that, you know, Sam McDavid is, like, deuces, I'm out, and he ends up in, I don't know, like, L.A. randomly. And the storyline then is going to be what? Like, oh, you made a... Oh, God, I said L.A. Like, I just brought back Wayne Gretzky. Like, I was like, there it is, right there. I have Edmonton's storyline ready for me. Like, <laughs> you know, best captain in the world gets traded th- to L.A. It- I thought you did that on purpose. <laughs> no. I know, I thought it was on purpose, too. <laughs> That's funny. I said it, and it hit me, and I was like, there it is, already. I have the storyline planned. <laughs> But, like, that's the thing. Like, if they're fishing for him and then the the narrative or something changes in the narrative, like, there it is already, right? Like, your storyline's there. I think that's what kind of annoys me is because now we see, like, Connor Bedard is young and he's getting all this media attention. And now the question in the media is Connor Bedard getting too much media. So it's like at some point, like, you guys know, like, the, the media, like, especially, like, fishing for stuff like that, like, you guys know what you're doing. And kind of, like, trying to, like, fish and coach, you know, coax those responses out of players for likes and clickbait wasn't it uh taylor hall was asked about that in regards to bedard and he probably knows a thing or two about having to be in the spotlight and having like every little bit of you like questioned like what was in the beginning of the year like when when bedard didn't have any points people are like oh what does this mean it's like it means nothing (laughs) <laughs> like it literally right. does not mean a thing <laughs> and at some point i feel like you can only ask these guys like and give these guys this i mean for i'm sure for bedard too like i haven't watched all of bedard's media spots and you know lord knows there's a bunch out there at this point 
But I'm sure it's all like the same like repackaged kind of question, like the same stuff they keep putting on Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl's doorstep. And it's like n- now the storyline is is the kid getting too much media the same way that the storyline in Edmonton is like, will Connor and Leon ever leave? And it's like, just let them play hockey. Just let it unfold. And however it unfolds, you know, Connor Bedard's what, 18? And he, he's still got hopefully years of good hockey in front of him. We don't have to. We don't have to drown him in media, and we don't have to keep asking Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl if they're happy, <laughs> if they want to leave Edmonton, <laughs> or if there's problems in the Edmonton locker room. Like, leave it alone. Leave it alone. These guys are good. They're the best hockey players in the world. There's going to be problems. Let them figure it out and stop trying to create problems for them. But it's the bad drama. Enough, they're going to go take <laughs> the drama. <laughs> <laughs> the NHL is the world's. Uh, most Sports interesting soap, soap opera. opera. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here for it. <laughs> the days I'm of our hockey I'm here for all lives. the tea. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just want so bad one day for somebody to ask Connor and Leon a question like that, and then they hit him with like, yeah, yeah, we can't stand this city. We can't stand <laughs> these questions. <laughs> they will, like, too. They probably will. They're so tired of it. Yep. I'm out because of you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> right, and they are in LA, like living it up. And they're just like, you know, were you tired of Edmonton? And it was like, Psh. I left the city and I still can't stop answering this question. <laughs> <laughs> just walk out of the back room. Those guys. Just deuces. Did you want to um, go ahead and talk about the, what is this called? The ice, the article? What is the thing I, called? I think, I think Drew should give us the rundown. That or we can do the pride. No, I, I think we should end on a happy note. So we'll okay. go into in the article first. <laughs> the ice oh, rink. Oh, oh, we're doing no. the, the, it? the ice rink. The, uh, the uh, inside the rink. That one, hockey is you. for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, confusing approach to hockey is for everyone. Um, I had some feelings some big feels about that article in so many different ways. Um, I listen, I don't even know. Okay, it's first of all, the article is super confused, right? It opens with like this weird reflection of how people are uh, tired of political programming in sport. And then it goes okay, on wait, to wait. say, please, like, please explain to me what political programming is. <laughs> I don't know. I guess people are tired of seeing stuff about like uh, uh, global pandemics that impact everybody, or you know, systemic racism. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. terrible to speak out about those things. But, apparently. but not, uh, very... but not war happening in the Middle East. Yeah, interesting. I really thought okay. it, it, it's interesting that you bring that up too, Nessa, because like when I read the article and the first thing I see is like political programming. I'm like, so it makes maybe you uncomfortable for. Uh, everybody to have an equal voice but you are totally okay we, you know that would that's a that's a, such a political subject but you're totally okay with all of these nhl teams standing out and and saying or coming out and saying we stand with israel like the, is that not political in and of itself i don't know just the, things that i ponder <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so yeah, it's came close on... to home one of them doesn't so what you told us about this article is that when you came upon it, you had no idea who wrote it. And when I read the article, like obviously I'm, I'm not familiar with outside of you and probably a handful of other people I've noticed that also write for inside the rink. Um, I had no idea who, who wrote it and really what this article was going to be leaning in whatever direction i just knew that it was going to be in relation to the recent events that happened with like uh, the nhl retracting from the initiatives in terms of like no longer having the jerseys out on the ice and then with the the pride tape ban um so just like right off the bat like in the first paragraph like marketing to like every potential fan possible like the let me pull this up like the nhl has is obviously a little far back in their 
initiatives where wasn't it just last year that they did their first ever diversity and inclusion report and we found that the workforce is 84 percent white and i remember when i skimmed through that report their categories were white black hispanic and other and i just kind of like laughed my face off because i was like i am other (laughs) (laughs) sorry jay (laughs) i it's like it's already like you know standard standard like surveys and stuff like i already have a hard enough time where like asian is like my bucket that i go into because like the other options might not always be there um but the fact that i have now like i don't even get like the asian category i'm now grouped into like anyone who is not white black or hispanic (laughs) so there's like a plethora of other ethnicities you can be but because of how there's such a huge lack of diversity in the NHL, like there's not even a percentage that you can put to the amount of Asian people and other ethnicities that we all just get shoved into the same bucket. It's the what? It, it's yeah. Cla- uh, first of all, uh, when it comes like the 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 NHL's first diversity inclusion uh, or DEI. Gosh, DeSantis down here, he spits it around so much, I get all the words mixed up, so it becomes like one big conglomerate. I just refer to it like he does as woke. I'm like, all oh, those wokeisms. So <laughs> the, NHL's, <laughs> the NHL's first woke report. Um, I guess if we're banning everything from this point forward, are they one and done <laughs> on the diversity and inclusion report? <laughs> they did it. They did it once. They tried it out. Not for them. Moving on. <laughs> So this guy goes on to say, you know, that they've fallen behind with uh, marketing to every possible fan possible. Like, okay, on that, I definitely agree with you because they're definitely very far behind. Um, I don't understand why hockey is capitalized in this article. It's important. We'll we'll just ignore (laughs) that for the time being. Um, And he goes on to say that, you know, the hockey has taken a hit in so many turns and the few that he examples that he uses the um quebec major junior hockey league banning um banning fighting which largely is related to mental health and um the studies that have been done on c um, cte so i'm not really sure how that is a a uh, a hit in terms of like a negative for the league um a while back you know don cherry was fired for basically being racist for you know far too long that they passed his expiration date but that's, passed... that's bad for the sport jay that's bad for the sport it's terrible he keeps the traditions alive <laughs> <laughs> and then you know all, all the all the political programming that we've been um, subjected to the, the propaganda of the NHL that we've all been uh, unfortunately just been strapped into our seats to witness with no means of exit or changing the channel of our own free will we've <laughs> all just been subjected to it it's a very confused article because like he makes it sound like even the initiative itself was a marketing ploy. I think in the world of capitalism, you could safely say to some degree it is, right? But then he's like, all these other things that were terrible, like the kids beating each other in the head, that was awful marketing on the, on the QMJHL's part. How dare they take that out of the sport? Like, I don't know. These are kids. They probably shouldn't be out there throwing bows with each other. Like, it's WWE, my guy. I don't... It's so very, it's so weird because it's like these things that are parts of, of like ways to improve hockey culture. He, all, almost from the jump, addresses as marketing gimmicks of the game, like Don Cherry's racist. Oh, that's just a cute niche of the NHL. It just you know, that's what you, that's what you pay for. It's, it's just very cute to be told game. to go back to your country. <laughs> it's very cute. <laughs> <laughs> that's just. You know, that's part of the package. Like, you didn't sign up for the Don Cherry ad-free version. It's like... You know what it makes me think? That meme where it's, like, the grandma and the person, like, helping them. It's like, okay, grandma. Yes, yes. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. 
<laughs> the craziest thing too is like he goes through all that to call it a marketing ploy and then like strangely takes that left turn into like if we want to grow the game we should make you hockey more affordable which is not a bad take right hockey is an expensive sport i think if you want to grow the game you should definitely provide affordable options and make it wider especially with the youth audience um, but you, the way that I took that was kind of like you were shrouding your bigotry in like this innocuous like argument for people below the poverty line. Like, we don't need gay people in the sport, but poor people should have the right to play. As if poor people <laughs> can't be gay. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Those. You can only the identify only as one. Money. Pick one. <laughs> You have to pick one struggle. You only get one struggle See, in the land of that the free. Was, you can't choose them all. <laughs> that was the part that was so confusing about this article that it took me so long to get through it. And, you know, like I've been saying throughout the week, like, I know the struggle of writing. I wasn't the best writer in like grade school. I had to work harder in college just to, you know, get the get the scores that I needed on my on my papers and my research papers and you know, I got better at understanding how you take an idea and how you present it, how you break it down and then you conclude everything that you said. I ha all the way through the article, I'm like, "What are you talking about? What are your points? I don't understand." what you're trying to say because he went from in talking about the initiatives to ending it with youth hockey and how expensive it is and then throughout the entire article he you know um fails to mention or strategically ignores the fact that when he talks about the different knights that are now taking a hit with unable to wear the jerseys mentions hockey fights cancer and military appreciation night throughout the article but well, we know there's lunar new year we know there's black history month hispanic heritage month indigenous people's night diwali night so you're really not talking about what you opened up the article with <laughs> right right it was almost like like okay say I, I really feel like he used the hockey is for everyone thing to draw people into the debate and then really like made it this confusing thing. Like I like his you know standpoint being like, I, yeah, you know, like these people um, have been shoving their political programming down, you know, my throat. And that's a shame because now we've lost, you know, our military appreciation and our can It was like he was pandering because like, I feel like to a certain level, everybody can agree like a hockey fights cancer night is a good thing to have. And then uh, being aware of the typical white, cis, straight man demographic of hockey, that hockey, you know, military appreciation night also kind of panders to that key demographic. So it felt like he was concluding the whole article with this pandering. is like, their political programming ruined this for us. Now we don't get to have these things. And the game is too expensive for my kids to play. Like, I don't <laughs> 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 the like they don't go together at all it was just like it's like ha, wait i don't even know what i'm talking about like but we should talk about the cost okay i have yeah. a legit question for you jane though i don't know if i've asked you this before but remind me would you ever attend a military appreciation night like do you feel like that night would be for you no even <laughs> though you've served yeah. Do you see like, like any value just, in like most military people they they don't want to be like held on this pedestal. Like most of us just went in to uh, like a lot actually a lot of people go in for the for the college benefit of it. Like I went in for the fact that I was unemployed for over a year, I recently graduated, it was a recession, like I was lost. I need, I did not want to go and work three, four part-time jobs that had no meaning to me whatsoever. I was ready to get into the workforce. What is available to me and a friend of mine right around the time had gone into the Navy, was doing a lot of great things with her life. And I'm like, that looks, that looks good. Like, if they're gonna give me a job and I'm ready to go anywhere, like send me anywhere. Um, that's largely why I spent time in Europe. I was stationed out in Germany. 
So it gave me a lot of good things. There are a lot of things within the military. Like I experienced like my like you know my gender dysphoria to to a high level during that time. Like there's a lot of and I was there during the don't ask don't tell as well. A lot of things that are not great about the military in general. Like I had a good experience. There's a lot of people I know that did not. Most people, like a lot of people that I met, were mostly there for the college benefit or had no idea what they wanted to do with their lives. So is it not weird to go up to someone who who didn't like, like they just went to school through the military, and someone says thank you for your service? Like what did what did they do for the country? But I mean, they're I mean they're the things. This is a genuine question. I don't know. So, I mean, the way that you're kind of wording it is, like, unless you go and do, like, deployments, you're not actually doing, like, what people in the military should be doing, when really the military is just really just like any company. It's just the company is the U.S. (laughs) And, like, uh, most for the most part, my, my experience in it was I went into work. I did IT stuff. It... The IT stuff supported missions that, and it's not, okay. usually it's not like the main thing that everybody sees on the news. There's a lot of, just like when I was in Texas, I was just in charge of the, one of like the, like managing email. Like my job was really <laughs> like not that exciting in no, terms okay, of so what people think My question think was about. more so because I don't know what the service is. Like I'm trying to understand Nessa's, what the service is. The country. <laughs> Nessa's like, unless you're driving a tra- tank, did you even serve, bro? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so this the the sir, like, thank you for your service is the fact that like not everyone is going. One percent of the U.S. goes into the military, and when you go hmm. into military, you essentially sign your life away for X amount of years. It like if you want to quit, you don't leave tomorrow. Like, there's a right. lot of time and investment that's put into somebody. And if you decide you don't want to do something, you can't just, like, not do it. Like, so there's a lot right. of there's a lot of layers to service that is essentially doing something that's greater than yourself. So when they say, thank you for your service, it's like, that's what they kind of mean. But a okay. lot of people are not going into the military to be like, oh, I can't wait to get thanked. Like, it's like we're just going in there and we're, you know, we have like a bigger calling where there's people who who, who come from a military family or just really into, you know, doing public service, which is like in pretty much what it kind of is. And, and then, yeah, there's so... I don't go to these appreciation nights and be like, can't wait for like this whole arena to thank me. Like, I don't, I I feel very strange about those nights, but it's like, fine, I guess if you want to do it, but I don't really feel like it needs to be done. Yeah. I came to this hockey game just so I could stand while you all clapped for me. Thank you so much. (laughs) Acknowledge me, please. Right. (laughs) No, this is okay, what I planned this is, for when I enlisted. <laughs> I've heard I've heard things from like outside of the country where they think it's weird that there's such a like what is the word? People fa- like are fanatics about the military in a sense where they they make they're such fans of people who serve and they put them up on these pedestals because they they go through this this program their service. <laughs> um but they're like why why do you need that acknowledgement like you go into it just to do what you need to do why do you need to be like thank you for like thanked for that i don't know it's it's just this weird subculture in this country that just doesn't sit right with me it's like okay (laughs) good for you I do feel kind of weird, like, when I know somebody served, and I, like, I don't know their MOS, and so as somebody that was going to enlist, I was, my vision is terrible, so they were like, yeah, get out of here, blind fool, but, um, <laughs> um, I always feel weird when I don't know, like, somebody's, like, MOS, or their, like, occupation in the military, and I'm like, oh, well, thank you for your service, and they were like, yeah, I was a cook, and being very well aware that, like, military cooks have, like, some of the toughest jobs, probably, obviously, the most important, but it's also kind of weird, because it's like, I feel like that would be 
if that person wasn't in the military, it'd be like that person of being like the equivalent of like a subway uniform and being like, yo, thank you for the footlongs. Like, <laughs> it feels a little bit like that. Like, it's, but I am, I mean, obviously, like, not to knock the military's cooks because they have, like, you can't fight a war on an empty stomach. But it, it does feel, it is a little bit weird, right? Because everybody has like a different job in the military. Not everybody's driving a tank or, you know, just launching artillery shells. So it's, it's... The amount of people who, when I tell them I served in the Air Force, the amount of people who were like, oh my God, you were a pilot? No. I am way too short to be a pilot. And no, it's not just pilots in the Air Force. You know who supports the pilots? There you go. <laughs> Which is equally as important. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All these pilots. Hmm. I, I have a I have a former friend who is a pilot. So, but you know, not just pilots. So, so, I was going to enlist in the Air Force, and I never told I told my friends that, and they were like, "Well, can you see good enough to fly a plane?" And it's like they have other jobs. <laughs> they need people to protect the plane, to fuel the, the plane. plane. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay, well, thank you for schooling me because I literally have no knowledge of the military. <laughs> um, did we finish that article? Do we have any more thoughts about it? Or is it just like freaking confusing and makes no sense? And we read it for you so you don't have to. <laughs> um, it's just incredibly confusing. And, you know, I think it would benefit this guy to take a writing class. I think my favorite sentence yeah. in the whole thing is when he says, hockey is not for everyone because of multiple reasons. That was, so when I told you guys, when I put it and I first shared it, I didn't know, there is some context to the, listen, a straight white guy doesn't have a horse in this race, right? Like, we're not arguing about representation of straight white men in the NHL, they're on every roster. Um... When I got to that sentence in particular, I was like, oh, okay, I have an indication of, like, what's going on behind the scenes with this one. But that one was the one that really sent me, because then I was like, see, you deflected, essentially, the things that you're missing, the, the, the theme nights, the parts of the hockey culture that you enjoy that's been taken away from you, and... Now you've just deflected that, well, actually, besides it being too political, the sport is also just too ex too expensive. And so really, hockey isn't for everyone, not because of, of the NHL doing a terrible job at sticking up for its own core values, but because we just can't afford to play. It was like this really weird, like, we've now deflected in a different direction, but like while also disguising that deflection in and of itself as like an argument for something good. You know what I mean? Like, like you, you, it's like, it's a, I know there's an analogy that's escaping me right now, but like a, a sheep in wolf's clothing, right? Like, okay, I'm here to protect the little guy, but actually, actually, I've just, I've just deflected blame from what I've really been dunking on this whole article, which is like the NHL has been too political. It was. It's just a, such a confused. <clears throat> I think we should we should actually clarify that by too political they mean they've been supporting the gays because that's exactly. really all this comes down to. <laughs> exactly supporting it, right. <laughs> pride tape too much. We it's we don't want to see that gay that big gay tape. It's offensive. It's become too political, and now we've lost all these things, and we can't play because it's expensive. That's what this article is saying. <laughs> essentially it's just so it's like you know if you wanted to make the point about they're not you know hockey being too expensive then that's the article he should have wrote right like that should have been the take but don't tell me that hockey is too expensive and that's the reason why the nhl shouldn't model inclusive behaviors <laughs> it's so right. confusing okay. just like the, <laughs> like i said the layout of how the whole article was written like every moment where he said things like 
you know, it, this and that because of multiple reasons. I'm expecting you to tell me what those are, and then you jump into this other. So from the art, from that sentence of hockey is not for everyone because of multiple reasons, and he jumps into freedom of choice and speech is an important and basic human right to value. Like that's a completely different topic. Like. <laughs> That's and not how the you. That's, right that's not how you bring us into the next paragraph. Like, it just what? that's why I like, kept saying. What? Like, that's why I kept saying. I feel like he's just writing in his blog. Like, no, you're actually supposed to be writing an article. That my God, you're actually getting paid for somehow. Like, I just. Oh. <laughs> Like, like you guys are saying, if you're going to write about Pride Night, write about Pride Night, even if you disagree with Pride jerseys being out there. Okay, then if that's the take you want to make, make that take. But don't shroud your weird, like, I'm I'm here to protect the kids because hockey is, hockey is expensive. That's why we're protecting the kids. Not for any other political reason. Like, don't, you don't, it's a, I don't understand. It was so confused. And I'm reading the article and I'm like, what, what are you, it was like, you know, that scene in Finding Nemo where he's like, it's like Marlon and he's like, he's trying to speak to me. I know it. That's how I felt when I was reading that article. <laughs> he's trying to speak to me. I know it. There's words here somewhere. <laughs> All right. Let's move Anyways, on. This let's has move been fun. To, <laughs> let's move on to some highlights of, of inclusion and diversity and, and all that good stuff. Uh, Nessa, you want to give a reaction to the the sharks mentioning pride pride tape and and all this controversy? Okay, so what game was this? The nineteenth, three days ago. Was today Sunday? Thursday? Thursday? Maybe it was the Bruins. <laughs> was it the Bruins? Yeah. Okay, the Sharks played against the Bruins Thursday. Um, I I'm assuming this was during warm ups or pregame pregame live. The broadcasters, so Brody Brazil and who was on there? I forget. Hannon. Who was with him? Scott Hannon. Hannon. Scott Hannon um, asked Tara Sloan. We all Tara. Tara Sloan. <laughs> Tara Sloan. Yep. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm tripping all over my names right now. <clears throat> Let's calm down. Tara Sloan <laughs> is a big ally. She advocates for all queer rights in hockey. Love her. We've had her on the pod before. She's like. I don't know. Every time I see her, I just want to give her a big hug. Love her personality. Um, they asked her about her thoughts on the NH the NHL's ban on Pride tape, and she pretty much spoke her mind with you know being very professional about how you know this basically takes um, the choice of the players to be able to uh, support these 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 events that they want to support. Really, I don't. I mean, I don't like that everyone beats around the bush and calls them the events, the, you know, their beliefs are the reason that they don't support these things. It would it make me feel better if they were straightforward, say, okay, they're sharing their religious beliefs because they don't believe in queer people. <laughs> like, they don't, they don't want to support pride. They, they don't want the players to have the freedom of choice to be able to support pride, to make queer folks feel comfortable in the sport. That's basically what everyone is saying when they're beating around the bush with all these silly words. But she was basically saying, you know, um, she talked to people in the, uh, in the organization. She talked to David Quinn and asked him his thoughts on it. And he's like, everyone in, knows where I stand on this. And we as fans do, he's only been here for a season. This is his second season, but he was involved in one of the pride events for the sharks this uh, last season. He coached the San Francisco Earthquakes, who's a, is it a gay, is it gay men or is it queer folks team um, in San Francisco? I think it's primarily it's, gay men, but I'm sure that they're open to, you know, like a co folks. Co yeah. I don't um, think it's exclusively a, 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 like a men's team, but I think they primarily <laughs> have gay men. Okay. So nice. queer hockey team in San Francisco. Um he coached them for like this event that we, that they did where it was the uh, Sharks staff, like the, the front office people were went against the San Francisco Earthquakes and he coached the Earthquakes. The pictures that they put out, he looks so happy being involved. Uh, he, you know, he, is, he basically said he, he knows where the organization stands and we all know where they stand. You know, they're very, very supportive of us. Um, 
And it was just really nice to hear, you know, somebody in this hockey world, <laughs> like not just players individually, but like an organization, someone from the organization speaking up and saying, you know, we fully are like, we believe this. We want our fans to know that we stand by them, that we don't stand by this ban. We're going to do what we can to, to make sure you feel included anyway. Um, but she also asked him if he would support a player if they decide to go against that ban. Um, and he was like, I would fully support them. You know, it's their choice. <sighs> Did I get everything? Yeah, I think that was the gist of it. Um, so, you know, like, like those those are the little things that we hold on to that you know like me and us are fans of an organization that I, we've had multiple people from the organization um on and we feel that their responses have been genuine we continue to engage with them off offline the the sharks invited me and Nessa to um to be so in pride Valley. parade with them <laughs> um we've i've gotten we've gotten from multiple sources like even the two players from the barracuda that came to the the pride parade like we like like me in particular i was a little uncertain about one of the players and we've had multiple sources confirm us that like he wasn't just there for publicity like he's definitely been learning along the way and he understood going to the event he agreed to go to it he enjoyed it so it's really nice to kind of get like those reassurances and you know at the end of the day it's like we're also here to advocate and to raise awareness of like for other teams and other leagues that are doing great things because we don't want to just like be satisfied with like oh well at least we're rooting for a team that like you know supports and sees us but it's like no we want that for everybody else and like um JT Brown, who's uh, one of the broadcasters for the Seattle Kraken, he was photographed wearing a wearing a, a suit that's got lovely rainbow decorations on the inside. And we do know that um, Lexi Brown is a pansexual uh, woman. And so I just love that these like we're you know we're familiar with you know JT Brown. He was one of the guys, uh, well, probably one of the only ones like during a game that it like raised his uh raised his fist in solidarity like when he was still um playing in in relations to to black lives matter so we know where he stands it's great that he has not just just like you know stop there like he's finding ways to like you know i need to be visible i need to show my support you know the whole family shows their support by going out to you know seattle had their pride event like some some months ago the whole family was there and and everything like that um and then so this leads me to travis Dermott. like we've uh discussed last episode our thoughts of players being asked about their um how they feel about the the pride tape ban and there's a lot of players who we're familiar with that have spoken out in previous years that they support you know the queer community and stuff like that but as um we discussed last episode it's like okay but now we're at a crossroad where the league has taken a couple steps back so now words are not enough now we need the action you're saying that you are disappointed in it some are saying that they you know would go against the ban things like it that. it is what it is was my favorite one like she thinks <laughs> <laughs> so l yesterday the first person to follow up his words with action was Travis Dermott. He was, he had some pride tape, um, at the, 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 the butt end of their, of his stick. It was photographed by multiple sources. He, the, the coyotes actually posted it on their, their Instagram stories. That's where the photos came from. And as we stand right now, the, um, the NHL told the athletic, we will review it in due course. 
So yeah. they have this ban, but they don't actually have any guidelines of what this ban actually means. So I think that in itself already is kind of silly because it's like, oh, yeah. we can't, we're not going to have this rainbow tape. But what if I do? Good question. There's no punishment. <laughs> like, that is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> we're so used to these guys just like going along with Listening, things yeah. so mm. now that they're like okay but I'm gonna not and they're like damn we didn't think you were gonna do that um <laughs> <laughs> well, <whoops. laughs> I think it's a critical moment right now on allyship too because um like I love Travis Dermott he's a real one I, I was so sad to see that he was departing from the Canucks um and I hope he has a great healthy season in Arizona so to see Ter- Dermot put his money where his mouth is right out of the gate, I think that's what we need, right? Like, now we're seeing the, the, the players, there's been we're talk about, like, t- teams ordering pride tape and still pushing back against that ban. And I think that's an important part of allyship right now is, is so what if you don't go along with it? What are they going to do? And clearly they have no idea. And it's not, you know, the NHL has done a bit of bowing. People forget only seven players, seven protested the pride jerseys and now we don't have any theme nights yeah so i feel like with that that argument though we still don't know what goes on behind the scenes there probably were a lot more players they just didn't speak up at the time or publicly you know i'm sure there were more than just seven players but everyone likes to blame these seven players for it (laughs) (laughs) and that's and that's a fair point and i think that's why it's important too for like the guys that come out and say well, we don't have a problem with it. You know, we believe that hockey is for everyone. We'll wear the jersey. We'll use the tape. I think it's important for them to do that, to put their money where their mouth is and to prove that if it was only seven players that came out and rejected it or that we know about publicly, then I think the majority of the players that are maybe telling the media and, may, you know, because to, to be like going back to our conversation about the Oilers, like people are constantly fishing for a headline, right? So it, and guys are constantly trying to avoid controversy in the locker room. So maybe there's a bit of, of well, we don't have a problem with it, even in the press too, to an extent. So I think that's where the pressure comes a little bit now. It's like, okay, you said you didn't have a problem with it and we need you right now to step up and help us fight. Are you going to live up to where you, you know, the standard that you set for yourself and others in the locker room? Or is there still going to be a bowing out of like, well, the NHL said we couldn't use it, so now we can't support, darn. Yeah, so it's uh, kudos to Travis Dermott for leading the pack, and I hope that other players come out and uh, and follow the example and push back. Because obviously the league has no idea what they're going to do about it. I don't know, how goofy would it be for the league to do something like suspend Connor McDavid because he like chose to play 10 games with Rainbow Tape? Like, what, what, what are you doing? Like, there's bigger things to worry about in, in the sport of hockey than the... I mean, because at the core of it, like, that's like the, like, oh, my God, Rainbow Tank, you know? Like, what if the... It's so box. scary. What if, <laughs> right. It's just awful. That colorful... T- like, what about the dudes that are out there with, like, blue tape and pink tape? Why is it just Rainbow Tape? What if I had a piece of tape from every single individual strand of tape? Like, how technical are we about to get with your Rainbow Tape fan? Like, come on, NHL. This is crazy to me. So, yeah. I think Travis Dermott, I, I hope he's... uh unleash the floodgates a little bit i hope all those dudes that say they don't have an issue with it really do put their money where their mouth is you know yeah that's what we're waiting for yeah i would like to see there's been other players like um like uh mcavoy like right charlie mcavoy over in in boston who's been at the pride parades and stuff like okay you come out with pride tape on your on your skate now or it if there's a whole team, you know, like, uh, you know, Matthew Kachuk was in the, the Panthers locker room and he said that they're welcome. Okay, well, if the whole locker room feels that way, then how about the whole team come out with pride tape? What are they going to do? Suspend the whole team at once? Come on. <laughs> I will be ready with a box of popcorn. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. Any more closing thoughts before we close out the episode? No. Nope. Sounds good. We talked a lot today. <laughs> yeah, we did. All right. We did. So that's it for this episode. Uh, once again, welcome, Drew. It's been great Ooh. to have you so far. Excited for the future. Um, so as we always, we definitely had more more hockey talk this episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, as always, I am your host, Jay. Co-host, Nessa. You need to sign up. Florida Man Drew. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, guys.